it's actually Gerhard. But uh, everybody calls me Gary. Um, yeah, I started Care of Editions, the label, in January of this year with the ambition of offering listeners and musicians just a means of navigating the streaming era. I think basically my, my hope was to address the contemporary moment for all of the strengths and challenges that it offers. And one of these challenges to me that I find really fascinating is that in this historical moment, the most important medium to my mind, digital media, has such a weak economic value. I think as, you know, for labels and curators, it's just as important to curate the value of the medium as it is the music that we release. And so through a series of uh, experimental business models and distribution strategies, I'm trying to essentially give ground to my curatorial approach. And I want to talk about the first strategy, which is called uh, negative money. This is our pilot model. Under negative money, we release vinyl and we release downloads. And the vinyl we sell just like normal, and the downloads we actually pay listeners for. And the amount of money that you would get is tied to the download edition number. So if you get download number one, you get the full album, just like the vinyl, except that you get a check, and the check is worth $1. And if you get download number two, you get a check for $2. So it goes all the way up to $45. $45. And I started a Swiss bank account so that I could send these checks um, in your, your local currency. So I didn't want people to sign up for some third-party service, and I didn't want people to pay any kind of uh, fee for converting the currency. So the checks, they're all really unique. They, they look different in every country. Um, this one was for Italy, and um, I found it actually really interesting because the guy bought the vinyl. He said to me, I'm so excited to get the vinyl. Can you just send me a download link so I can hear it before I get it? I said, well, no, that's not how the concept works. <laughs> um, but it just so happened to be that the next download to be offered required one more vinyl to sell. And then I would open up automatically a new download. And that download was number 23, which is how many dollars the vinyl cost. And I said, if you were to buy one more vinyl, you would get the down, um, you, would, could, you could jump on the download, get that right away, and that would pay for the second vinyl. So you'd have two vinyl for the price of one plus a download. And so I found this one to be kind of an interesting moment. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what they look like in Germany where I live but basically the, the Swiss bank account is more of a practical thing they work with all these banks from all over the world so that I don't have to go there I can just punch in the check online and they send it to me from a local bank. But it has this really added, I don't know, this nice added value for my purposes that the people getting the downloads, they're also getting sort of an, a piece of um, ephemera. And it's also building time into the process. So you can listen to the music right away, but at the same time, you're still expecting something. And I find that valuable. I feel like that's a lost quality of buying physical products. I'm not against digital media, I'm actually for it, but I'm trying to sort of unwrap what it could mean. I find that a lot of strategies are a means of giving up. I find that people who just say, you know, just take my music for free. I, okay, you want to do that, that's great, but for me it's not really contributing to the development of what is digital distribution. And in that respect I find Napster to be more of an ally in that question. And I'm not doing anything, I don't think, illegal, but I'm still trying to, to play with this, this medium. I'll show you the website a little bit more. So down below you see all the releases kind of in one long scroll. And they all have the same format. 
you can't see it anymore because they start to disappear. Actually, it's always a picture of the front cover, a picture of the back cover, and then a picture of the artist. <coughs> but what you see on the side here is sort of the running inventory of the downloads. And so as soon as someone downloads whichever number, that number disappears. And so the website is shrinking all the time. And here you can barely see you know, the back cover anymore. Ezra Buka's re release, you can't see any of it at all. And so it's a bit a visualization of the, the sort of disappearance of the digital inventory. You can kind of see um, as the download numbers increase, it takes more and more vinyl sales to be able to afford um, a download. I don't give a download away until I've already sold enough vinyl to be able to pay for that download, so I'm never really going into debt. And actually, the amount that I save from the vinyl profits is only enough to cover the production costs. And that would only happen at the end of an edition. So every edition has 118 vinyl and 45 downloads. And if I sold all of yeah, the vinyl and the downloads, I would recover just enough to pay for the vinyl production and sort of the loss of downloads. Sort of wrapping everything up in the end. I started a campaign uh, in July, I believe, to kind of further the, the personalization of the sales. Um, <clears throat> And the, and the visualization of the, the download inventory. I built, I built a series of furniture. I had them fabricated. They're chairs, basically. And inside the chairs, I put vinyl. You can see it. Sorry, I have all these pictures. Here, you can see it. And the amount of vinyl that's inside of a chair is the amount of vinyl, vinyl that needs to be sold in order for one download, that particular download, to be offered. And so, in a sense, this furniture is holding the physical inventory while representing the digital inventory. And they come apart really easily. There's no nails. They can fold up in little stacks. And what I've been doing is taking them across Europe into uh, off spaces and galleries and certain bookstores and just setting up shop because they have sort of a, a retail interface because when you stack the chairs on top of each other, they have a little bit of like a, um, a record bin interface to them. It's, it's of course really weird when you go to a record store that's full of you know three records, but a lot of them. So this was the first iteration of that project. It was at a festival called Relevante Music in Berlin, and I wanted to sort of counter the this disappearance that I'm visualizing by bringing into the picture the, the making of. And so one of our musicians, Lucretia Dahl, was for the whole festival working in the foyer on her upcoming release. And so it created kind of a concert-like setting, even though I don't think it was quite as satisfying probably to most people as a concert, because she's sitting there you know, actually tweaking out and working and recording and rehearsing. And a lot of the, the background noise of the actual festival, people talking, you know, is sort of interfering with her working process, and those some of those elements are uh, brought into the recording. It's not finished yet; it probably will come out in spring. And we also worked with the space. Um, this this white curve on the left here—that's the bar, and it's always there. And this other little curved table is usually in the far corner as a merch table, but we use that as a surface where I could, you know, sell records, and she could work on it. And we positioned it right across from the bar, so there's just enough space for one person to walk through. <laughs> and, you know, it's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek gesture that, you know, you can buy a drink in one hand and a record on the other. And at the same time, it kind of created a nice little intimate space. But yeah, this is a, this is a campaign called Care of Merchandising. And um, I think it sort of brings the traveling salesmanship um, two downloads. And I think for me there's 
there's something really important about that. And on a business level, it's obvious. I think if you have this concept that doesn't quite make sense, you know, you should try to make it as clear as possible. Try to visualize it. I mean, that's basically the organizing principle of our branding is just making everything really clear. I think uh, some of the records are on the table if you ever, if you want to look at them, go ahead. But the back covers, they're all the same. They have, they look basically like this. They have the business model and you can see the relationship between download avail availability and vinyl sales. And whenever someone buys a record, I mark with a little um, black dot in ink on the record that, and you can see where your edition is, especially in relation to, you know, what downloads you may have unlocked. And that looks a little bit like this. These are the edition marks. But I think it's somehow more than just about making sense. I, I feel that it's a little bit about claiming the obvious, which to me is that we're no longer in the century of Duchamp. You know, Duchamp was really exposing the, the shortcomings of retinal art, you know, just speaking to the, the eyes. And downloads don't have that problem. We don't understand downloads with our eyes. I think we understand them with our thoughts. And in that sense, they lose their particularity. They kind of are all the same. And to me, that makes them the perfect vehicles for an industry that wants to just keep cloning its success stories, putting out um, sort of variations of what it's already done. I think commercial success has always been sort of a threat to, uh, a homogenizing threat to pop music. But I think with the emergence of the digital era, it just has become all the more so. And I think you see it, I think you see a sort of desperation in pop music right now. I think um, an interesting observation comes from the curator Maria Lind, and she's actually citing a report I think it's called the European Cultural Policies 2015. And it says that the distance between art which is really critical and full of ideas and art which is spectacular and popular is becoming greater and greater. That by the year 2015, they really won't have much contact with each other. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but I, I find it to be really interesting. And I am really interested in both experimental music and pop music, and when I say pop, I, I mean popular. I, I find that these are perennial forms of music. I don't think it's like reggae or, or cubism, which are great, but they're really historical instances. I don't think they will keep coming back the way that I think experimental music and pop music will. And so this relationship to me is really important to deal with. And, you know, when I look at someone like Jay-Z, maybe it's not a fair example, but to me, it's almost like he is desperate to slow this trend down, to stop it. But he's not doing it from within pop music. He is asking for help from outside. And that's not, that's not the way I would go about it, but it's really not um, atypical. It's sort of the trend. He's associating himself with um, artists, performance artists, conceptual artists, Lawrence Wiener, Marina Abramovich, comparing himself to Picasso. <laughs> I, I don't have a problem with Jay-Z. I feel a little bad. It's, like, it's almost like not his fault because we're at this point where, well, sorry, I mean, well, I just think that pop music has such, um, it's so successful that the pr pressure to maintain that sex success and the capability to maintain that success makes it very difficult for a pop musician to reimagine what pop music is the way that I think it used to. And I'm not nostalgic, but I just don't see, let's, you know, the predecessors that maybe we could tie to Jay-Z, whoever, John Lennon, Bob Dylan, Prince, Michael Jackson, I don't think they had to compare themselves or associate themselves. At least they didn't have to go out of the way to do that because I felt like, to me, they were still working out what the idea of pop music was. 
developing that through their music. And I don't think they had to, uh, yeah, stress the association to critical thinking and, and ideas. And my, my feeling, yeah, and you also see with the hybrid of pop music. You have so many uh, pop musicians sort of bringing in elements of experimental music, and I don't think that's really the answer either. Um, I have the feeling that for pop music to reinvent itself, it has to come from within pop music. And I don't think it's going to be by throwing ideas at it. Maybe it's, it's not a very fair analysis of the, the history of, of music, but I see it happening. I've see, I, I feel like I've seen this happen with a number of musicians. Um, I don't know, Beethoven, a career full of experimentation, working on a new idea of what music could be. But then his own success, I think, became sort of an obstacle for him to overcome. And then, I don't know, I, I find the, the last piano sonata totally weird. And I think that he is sort of experimenting and reacting to his own momentum. A more um, contemporary example, Cornelius Cardew, another lifetime full of experimentation. But then at a certain point, he reacts to himself and starts writing these um, piano ballads in homage to uh, Chairman Mao. And it's just so weird. Uh, there's another example. <coughs> Morton Feldman, um, he was working on a piece that he never finished, which was for solo violin. And if you look at the score, you have to, it's weird. I mean, here are these, this, this very stoic solo violin piece, and it's just full of triple sharps and triple flats. And for those of you who read music, you've got to wonder, why is he doing that? It doesn't make any sense at all. And a composer named Mark Sabat, who I imagine a number of you know because he's Canadian, and I think he knows you. <laughs> he, he is a pioneer in tuning, and he put together sort of the pieces to the puzzle, looking at statements that Feldman had made and um, talking to one of Feldman's collaborators. I forget the name of the violinist, but this violinist was a tuning expert. So, he finally realized that this was an alternate tuning notation. So these triple sharps were actually talking about that pitch in a certain, from a certain perspective, certain relationship to other tuning, other pitches. And so this is actually going to be what, uh, our next release. Um, Mark put together the, this piece and a number of other pieces that are inspired by that tuning that Mark wrote on his own. It's actually our first acoustic album, and it's just solo violin for the most part with a little bit of um, two violins. And that'll come out, I think, in January. But for me, you know, with a business model like this, I don't want to release only experimental music because, in a sense, it's actually very much like working with the spirit of capitalism, trying to sell something with a gimmick something that wouldn't normally sell on its own. And I didn't want to release only pop music because, in a sense, then it's more of um, inter an interruption into something that was doing just fine before we started slowing it down. And so, you know, on one hand, curating for this label is very much a gut, <coughs> gut thing, the way a lot of art purchasing is. But I do try to formulate it because I do have sort of an ambition with the curating. And so just generally speaking, I'm looking at music which is sort of borderline experimental music and borderline pop music. Just a very general category. And I know that if I talk to 95% of musicians, they will think, oh, that's me. <laughs> um, part of the problem is because the word experimental has probably lost its poignancy. I mean, everybody who twiddles some knobs and bites on their reed thinks they're being experimental. and I. I don't want to be sort of elitist about the term, but I, I do have a little bit narrower of a definition of what that might be. But when I say borderline, to me, that's more the important part of the definition, because I'm actually talking about experimental music which might not operate according to a lot of the stock gestures that we've come to know from experimental music. 
So immediately that that takes a big chunk of experimental music out. Um, music that's possibly experimental but might come underneath the radar. And then with pop music, I think pop music just operates with a different understanding of stock gestures. I can't really imagine pop music without stock gestures. And so for me, I'm like I said, I don't want pop music to sort of be infiltrated by too many ideas. I, I don't want it to develop a sort of metaphysical um, uh, notion of, of what it can be. But I'm certainly not looking for music which is just sort of, um, I don't know what the, the right word is, but um, just, you're, tr you know, churning out pop tunes one after another. Um, I don't have a whole lot of time to go through all of our, our releases. I think I have like five minutes left. Um, but our first release was by Boris Hagenbart. And part of why I was attracted to this release is because it's actually already a classic in my mind. Mm -hmm. It was released in the 90s. And so for those of you in, familiar with record labels and what they release, typically the first release is a little bit important. You don't want it to be a re-release. You want it to be a statement about who you are and what you, maybe you have an unknown artist that you want to say, look, this is the future of what this label will be. But we went in the other direction. So we released an album that had already been out only on CD and asked Boris to do a vinyl version. And another reason I really like this is because there's so much sort of neo music concrete out there in the world. And he does sort of identify with music concrete, but also with dub. And it's a very interesting combination, and I feel that he does it in a really not stereotypical way. It's, it's a really fascinating album. Um, I have to leave it at that for now. Um, Scott Kazan is from LA, um, electronic musician. I think that the sort of description of what this album is does sound cliche to me. He says, you know, he wrote um, some patch that had innumerable compositions that would multiply and sort of disappear. And eventually the information became too much that it overflows. And I feel like I've heard that story too many times. But what's really unique about this album to me is that it's, it's in my mind, it's gorgeous. And I feel like I'm in this space sort of on the outside of something, but also on the inside. It's sort of a peripheral thing. And I can really listen to it in the background or very, um, very much attentively. And I, I appreciate that about experimental music when it can do that. Um, Ezra Buchla, um brings a lot of different talents together. He sings, he plays viola. He is also the son of Don Buchla, and he has inherited the genius of synthesizing. Um, this album is probably the closest to pop music that we come, but it's still quite distant. Anyway, um, I should probably leave it at that for the music that we've released so far. Our next release, as I mentioned, will be Mark, and then after that will be Lucrecia um, Dalt. And she's much more in the pop music world. She's touring right now with Julia Holter. So um, it gives you a sense of where we're going with this. I would like to get probably a tick closer to the pop music world since I feel that we've got our experimental bases covered. Um, but we'll see where that goes. Um, I think in closing, yeah. For me, I think it's really impossible to compete with iTunes and Spotify. I mean, a label these days, first of all, you don't have a catalog to offer a membership to anyone to listen to. I mean, I have three albums. Maybe a, a medium-sized label has 30 albums. No one's paying a membership for that. And I couldn't sell one track at a time for a dollar a piece the way iTunes does. Um, I would never profit. The problem, the problem is that well, let's look at it this way. The genius of iTunes and Spotify is that they made it more attractive to buy music than to get it for free. And I would say that negative money, this business model, sort of borrows that logic in a different way. So, yeah, you can steal it if you want. I don't really care, and I'm not going to police you on that. But it's more attractive to get the, the official version from us, because you'll get money for it. And even if you, if you don't want money, <laughs> there, there's something, there's something more, I guess, a lot of people don't actually cash the checks. They keep them because the checks, especially the lower numbered ones, like $1, I don't know why anybody would cash that. Because 
certainly there's a chance that it could be worth more than one dollar in the future. And so a lot of people are taking that um, gamble and they're keeping the checks. So um, for me that works because it, it, um, I automatically get refunded once the checks expire. <laughs> um, but so yeah, sort of leaving a trail of, of these paper checks and um, being out there in person, I find it to be really important for the digital medium. I find that the, the label to me is really multiple. And I mean it in not just the sense that we're going to come up with different business models, but because, you know, someone <coughs> might ask me why I pay people to download, and I don't really have a good answer for that. I think it's developing. On that note, I think it's, it's, it's not necessarily my place to have an answer for that. I, it's like science can't answer the question why science works or why math works or a calculator can't tell you why it calculates. Um, for me, this is just throwing something in, um, like a bit of pigment into the water and seeing how, how it reacts. But, you know, I think that when I start talking to people about it, I can't offer one answer, but I can offer a conversation. And I find that to be much more important. This is, for me, a discursive project. And I, I really appreciate to see that people start to, to lead the conversation from what they understand it to be. And in that sense, I find it much more valuable than me to say, look, this is what it's about. So anyway, that's my time. I um, would be very happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you.